we go ahead and begin. So, good evening. My name is Blair Thomas, and uh, I am very excited to have this inauguration of our Ellen von Volkenberg Pu Puppetry Symposium uh, for the sixth edition of the Chicago International Puppet Theater Festival. Begin with a first of our four book talks. And uh, so I just want to say uh, thank you for making your way up here and um, that uh, after the talk, uh, I in, in would invite you to uh, visit our studio at 433, which is th uh, directly below this space. Um, and in that, we have three gallery exhibits uh, happening. Actually, there's only two today, but we have two ex gallery exhibits because one is La Liga's puppets that are now getting ready for tomorrow's uh, puppet performance. But uh, Michael Montenegro has uh, a, a, a collection of paintings and sculpture work. He's a local puppeteer. It's uh, very fantastic. He's connected to the Little Carl production, and uh, he directed and designed that. And uh, and then we also have some some images from some of the productions on, on materiality, the shows that are in the festival itself. So, but without further ado, I would like to introduce Paulette Richards, and she's going to take it from here. So, greetings. Thank you for coming out. Um, we've been doing these symposium series for several years now, and in recent years, we were focused on kind of what I call the metaphysics of object performance. So we were getting very philosoph philosophical and theoretical, and people enjoyed it, but I also had some comments afterwards about it being too technical. So, so uh, when Blair and I started planning for this year, I thought, well, why not get to the nitty gritty, the materiality of the puppet? So for the all eight sessions this time, we're going to be talking stuff. And I'm very happy to introduce my colleague, Colette Searles, uh, who has produced this wonderful book on puppetry and Star Wars. So I'll give you her a brief bio, and then we'll just jump right into the questions. So Colette is associate professor and of theater and head of performance at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. There, she has devised award-winning puppet productions. And as a stage director, she, vis she specializes in visual storytelling. With um, her directing credits include Albert's Dream at the brilliant Baltimore International Arts Festival, Noah he Heidel's Vigils at the Woolly Mammoth Theater Company, and Fixed Boundary at San Francisco's Exit Theater. For her original works in found, person, found object puppetry, she has received grants from the Jim Henson Foundation and Puppeteers of America. Her new book, and that's what we're here to talk about today, A Galaxy of Things, The Power of Puppets and Masks in Star Wars and Beyond, and this book has recently received an Unama USA Nancy Staub Award for Excellence in writing on the art of puppetry. So please give a warm welcome to Colette Searles. Thank you. Well, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much for proposing this idea. Thank you for inviting me, Blair. This is at my first uh, Chicago International Puppet Festival. I've been wanting to come for years, so I'm so happy to be among this crowd. Thank you. Um, it's such an honor, and I just wanted, and it's so, such a pleasure to share the stage as I have a few times now with my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Paulette Richards, who wrote this amazing book. Uh, this, uh, the past several years, us three amazing women have been <laughs> writing these books. Um, this is Paulette's book, Object Performance in the Black Atlantic, which also just won a Nancy Staub Award, by the way, and is amazing. <laughs> you have to get it. If you don't have it now, get it soon. And reading the puppet stage by our friend, um, uh, Dr. Claudia Orenstein, um, who also helped a lot with this work that I did, and I cite her a lot, has written this book that focuses on the dramaturgy of the puppet in theater, and specifically, it's amazing. So please check it out, and she'll be here next week. Yes. And the two of you will be talking yes. next week about your book. So, um, yeah. Um, was I supposed to say, was I gonna? That, no, that's great. great. That's great. Okay, so hopefully we've whetted your interest. There's all of these great puppet books coming out but we're gonna talk about the one at hand today. Uh, and so could you give us a little background on how you came to write a book about 
puppets in Star Wars. Right, I know, I love that. <laughs> um, so I um, have, like many of people in this room um, who are puppetry artists and enthusiasts, I have a hard time explaining to people why they're so, well, that they are so amazing, first of all, that we see puppets all over the world, all over the place, advertising in film, video, TV, theater, on the street, everywhere we go, we see objects performing characters. Um, and we give them so, pay them so little mind and give them so little credit for what they do. So I'm always struggling for ways to explain this to my students, my theater classes, to people at parties uh, when I tell them what I do. And um, one day, I, and I love Star Wars, so one day I was watching a teaser for the new sequels that came out, I think it was 2015 or so, and J.J. Um, Abrams was, was charged with directing the new sequel in Star Wars that, that came out, the live action film, uh, The Force Awakens. And there was a teaser, I don't know if any of you saw this, but it was a teaser on YouTube that sort of broke the internet in which he was giving some sort of promotion about a contest. And behind him, he's on the set right outside in the desert. And this um, creature walks by that's just this kind of like peasant creature with a funny turtle-like face. And it's got like a basket of other creatures inside it that are all kind of moving around. And, and it just walks, just walking by, minding its own business. And it looks at the camera. And J.J. Abrams is like, and, and you know they did this on purpose, but it looks accidental. And everyone just freaked out because they thought, oh my, and the response from the press and even, even the cover of Vanity Fair, I think, was, oh my gosh, the practical puppets are back. You know, after the CGI dominated prequels, we're going back to the old school. And, um, and I suddenly went, oh, okay, I got to tell it to them in, in, in Star Wars. It's a line from 30 Rock, I think, it was a TV show where <laughs> one of the comedians had to explain the Uncanny Valley to someone, and, and she's like, oh, hey. <laughs> and says, uh, uh, just tell it to me in Star Wars. So this book is, is telling it to you in Star Wars, essentially, why puppets and masks are so amazing. Um, so I do want to really quickly say, if I, and I, if you beg my, your indulgence here, uh, people have asked me to explain what's in the book. It's actually a fairly skinny book, as you can see. Um, I tried to make it really a quick read. It's five chapters, and, but they're all kind of separate essays that all come, they, they connect together. But I know people come to this with different areas of interest. You know, you might be a puppet scholar, you might be a practitioner, um, or a big Star Wars fan. So I'll just quickly say what's, what's in here. Um, Chapter one is sort of a, is a rundown of all of the live action Star Wars in release order from 1977 to 2023, two-ish, three-ish, um, of live action Star Wars. Not the animated series, none of that, but just anything that was live. Um, and it looks at the journey of puppets and masks and how they were made and what the technologies were and how they contributed to story through that trajectory of about a little over 45 years. So you're kind of looking at, you know, a, a real beginnings of the practicals, puppets and masks, and only a few of them, and they were mostly evil characters, to becoming more meaningful through Yoda. And then you had the CGI explosion and the controversy over that with the prequel films, and then the sequels and the new streaming series, which went back to the old school, but then also brought in some really amazing new digital technology, such as performance capture. So I take everybody through that, and then I talk about something called the Star Wars Thing Aesthetic, which is a way that Star Wars treats materiality um, with certain qualities. I won't go into all of them now, but like, for example, there's a recycled element to everything in Star Wars. It uses a lot of like repurposing and recycling. Uh, chapter two is a theoretical chapter, which I try to make really simple and easy. I talk about the three Ds, which we'll get into. Um, so it, I use Star Wars characters to explain, for example, the concept of distance, of puppets have distance from human beings and why that's exciting. And chapters uh, three and four are companion chapters, which, which do a deep dive analysis of what I consider the strongest, one of the strongest puppets, I'm not alone in this, like I consider this, a lot of people who are more important than me in film criticism consider Yoda to be one of the greatest achievements of uh, special effects in the history of film. Um, and how I talk about how Yoda came to be, the history and the trajectory of his, of his creation, um, how, how and how he affected the story, how those few scenes that he was in, in Empire Strikes Back, actually, I make a case for how they launched the deeper meaning of Star Wars, and I, I would suggest even, I'm not sure Star Wars would have continued if that hadn't worked as well as it did. 
then I make a similar case for Darth Vader. So I talk about puppets in chapter three, and in chapter four I talk about the best example of a mask, which I think is, is Darth Vader. Um, and I talk about how the revelation, anyone, anyone led besides me and my, my folks here, see Star Wars in the theaters back in the 70s and 80s. Okay, right. So when, when we saw, the, when the, I'm sorry, spoiler alert, but Darth <laughs> Vader is Luke's father. Um, <laughs> but the moment when he said, I am your father, woo, the, the revelation of that was powerful, but it was powerful in part because we didn't know what was behind that mask. And we'd seen that little gross kind of moment where we see the back of his head. The revelation of the mask and the fact of the mask really made that, um, that movie work. And it also launched a storyline which, which continued onward. In fact, if you think about it, the original films asked the dramatic question, what was behind, what's behind the mask? And it answers it in the climasks. We see what was behind the mask. The, the prequels then answered the question, well, how did that mask get on in the first place? How did that happen? So um, I make a case for how the materiality of puppets and masks are deeply, deeply meaningful. And then the longest chapter, chapter five, um, is a, is a hi, Jeff. good to see you. I'm seeing so many wonderful friends here. <laughs> um, is actually, is about, um, is about how material characters are so powerful that they can cause harm. And they have. I talk about racial representation in Star Wars, um, negative racial representation and stereotypes. I get deep into Jar Jar Binks, but I also try to really look at the positive potential that could have been there for that character. And I also look at um, images of women and servitude in, in service in the droids. So that was a really uh, interesting and fun and challenging chapter to write mm -hmm. and sing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you for that overview. I hope everybody's now just salivating to get their hands on this book. <laughs> um, and so linking into our theme, once again, materiality, I wanted to ask if you could talk about um, the concept of material characters a little more. Give me a moment yeah. to give some background because if I'm not mistaken, it was Dazia Posner who put first put this concept of material performance out into the world, yes? I think she did. I mean, I looked up, I, I, I'm not sure she was the absolute first person to utter it, but she's, she's, I would certainly credit her with the term mm -hmm. um, and the idea. Um, having spoken with her and, and read very carefully what she wrote in the introduction to yes. the Routledge Companion of Puppetry and Material Performance, another book you must have from mm -hmm. 2014. Um, and it, um, in, in that introduction, she and her co-editors, John Bell and Claudia Orenstein, uh, both write about uh, their definition of puppetry and material performance, expanding the term. The idea of material performance um, being that uh, that that puppets there's there's more than puppetry to puppetry, and that puppets have agency. Mm -hmm. They have agency to, and I think there's a quote from Dacia Posner uh, to shape and create, and that they they themselves in their materiality in their presence have the power to shape and create, mm -hmm. and that really was helpful to me because I thought. You know, Darth Vader's mask alone, by itself, without being on or part of any body, has power. It's, it has power, the meaning that it's been given. Um, I mean, it, the whole sequel trilogy, in some ways, kind of looked at the melted mask. You know, that image of the melted mask was itself so powerful. I have a photograph in here of how it's used as a sort of religious relic, mm -hmm. almost. Um, it has power to create stories. I was at Party City while I was writing this book a few years ago, and I was like balloons of like all the current pop culture characters, Frozen, whatever it was, and there's Darth Vader, and it's like 2022. <laughs> you know, Darth Vader from 1977. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's how powerful it is. So, um, I think so. I so. Did you want me to talk about how I came up with um, the term? I'm, I'm going to lead you into that. I'm for so a second. sorry. So, no, 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 no. This is great. This is great. So, we, I'm establishing a lineage here. So, from Dacia Posner's work we get material performance. And then I was at, I think it was the 2017 uh, Puppeteers of America mm, National maybe Festival. Maybe 19. 19, yeah. yeah. Um, critical exchange session. And Colette gave a presentation about this work that she was beginning at that time. And she talked about material characters. And I'm like, so she's expanding on Dacia. And I'm like, oh, I need that. Because I was doing a lot of work with blackface puppets. because people would send the pictures of them to me and want me to verify, is this a mammy, is this a stereotype? And so this is in my face. And so it's also been a wonderful journey because we, we've laughed about being 
book pregnant together. Uh, Colette's got her contract from Rutledge like a month before I did, and so we would have these Friday afternoon uh, phone meetings. We'd both be folding laundry, and, and we would talk through concepts in the book. So I was running down what I wanted to do with this idea of material characters and calling these blackface stereotypes material characters. Um, and Colette was developing that further. Um, and I think that leads us into the three Ds, yes? A little bit, yeah, I'll get there, yeah. Um, I mean, I remember actually one time I gave up my laundry and I was walking around the backyard. <laughs> and, and I was like walking in circles and listening to you talk about Aunt Jemima bottles. And I was mm -hmm. like, you were like, are, those, are they material characters? I was like, yes. You know, are church fans material characters? Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, and I wanna thank Paulette too, this, you know, for, for suggesting that I really, I don't remember using the term material characters in that presentation. It's only because you told me I did and it was useful. Mm -hmm. That I was like, oh. <laughs> And then I started ticking and started going someplace with it. And what, what, where, what I found useful about making this sort of concrete noun out of the noun material performance of a thing, material character, is it gave me a way to collect as a community puppets, masks, and performing objects, which is the title of a really important essay by John Bell. <laughs> and I think Fra Frank Potion also talked about performing objects. This family of characters um, so that, not to suggest they aren't distinct types. I mean, within puppetry, there are very specific and distinct styles and types, and that's very important. So I don't mean to suggest that puppets are masks, or masks are puppets, but they are part of a, their cousins. And I think it's important to give that, that cousinship a name, to be able to give them a collective unified power, um, and talk about their b powers, because they share quite a few. So to, to me, a material character, as I suggest in the book, is a, a semi-human, a non-human, or a concealed human character that has come into being through a performer's collaboration with material mm -hmm. of some sort. Um, and so what I, what I thought about talking about in the book, I wanted to kind of come up with a quick and easy way to collect all the puppetry scholarship I've been reading into some clear terms. So I came up with this idea of the three Ds, distance, distillation, and duality. These are not terms that I created myself. Um, distillation, I mean, di di you know, distance, for example, is talked about a great deal by Stephen Kaplan, mm -hmm. uh, Penny Francis and others, uh, duality, Dacia Posner and others have talked about. Um, but I wanted to kind of put them together in this alliterative trio to help people remember, to make it easier for professors like me to talk about <laughs> them. And uh, for, you know, and for theater artists, for directors, I'm working with a director right now who's putting puppets in their show for the first time and helping them understand what will make this character increasingly meaningful. Um, so yeah, there's distance, distillation, and then there's five dualities, um, and I can get into them if you like, but we can, we can see how much time we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, could you give us a little sketch for each Distance, sure, yeah. distillation, and duality. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So distance is this is is the fact. It's like the main power that all materials characters have, which is that they are distanced from the human being. So you know, um, C three PO looks a lot like a person in terms of the outline. Sounds like a person. Has a human voice. Um, acts like a person, but is not a person. Is clearly not. Is signaling with their material imagery mm -hmm. that they are, uh, even before they utter a word, before C-3PO utters a word, we know that's a non-human. Um, in fact, I talk about C-3PO as kind of our host through Star Wars because that's the first thing we see. Well, the first human-like, the first character we see in Star Wars is C-3PO, and we actually follow into Star Wars through his, um, his, his point of view. So um, there's that distance element. And distance enables things like violence. Um, C-3PO gets blown to pieces several times in Star Wars and is totally fine, you know, it can be fixed. Um, it, you know, so his head can come off and it's not grotesque. So it's a storytelling element to that. Um, it can create separation. S you know, you can take off Darth Vader's mask and hold it and look at it. Um, and that is, gives meaning. Um, so there's also, uh, distance just enables you to make a character look, it can have a hundred eyes, it can have, it can be this tiny, it can be a giant puppet. When you're distanced from human anatomy, which is essentially, th what, three to seven feet tall is the usual human, we're not that, we're not that, in terms of our shape, we're pretty narrow, you know. Um, if you look at all of creatures on the earth, you know, we, there's a lot more variety there, and puppets enable us to create with such um, abandon because of that distance. 
do, um, distillation is simple. It's just the, the fact that when you are creating, when you create a character out of material, it is going to, by nature, end up communicating, especially if it's well designed and well performed, real ideas in a really distilled way. And I use, I use Star Wars characters, mostly from the original films in the book, to explain these ideas, sort of tell it to you in Star Wars, because most of us can conjure up an image of Chewbacca or C-3PO because they're that famous. Um, so I talk about Jabba the Hutt, who's this, in, 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 in Empire Strikes Back, is this like big slug, and I talk about how he's a distilled idea of this greedy crime boss, right? So, you know, you think of um, the stereotype of a like ugly kind of, you know, slimy um, crime boss. He's literally slimy, right? <laughs> he literally throws his weight around. He's literally too important to walk. Like people just move for him, <laughs> himself for him. So, um, but it's, but if he'd been performed by just a human being in a costume, which I think was the original idea, it wouldn't have had that impact. So there's a visual impact to that. Finally, duality, um, it was really, this was the hardest one. And I, and I, and I really do want to credit uh, Dacia Posner again because she, she talks about all the different paradoxes in, in one of her essays in the, in the Companion to Material Performance, Puppetry and Material Performance. She talks about all the different paradoxes that a, I think she says, puppets are co-committally alive and dead, for example. Um, they are both living and not. They are both real and fictional. Um, and so I, I thought, this is exciting. So how can I make this di digestible in, in what I'm thinking about material characters? Um, and so I have these five dualities. I'll just give two examples. One of them is novel familiarity. So they're paradoxes, essentially, that a, that a puppet can be both, a material character is both this and that thing, which are opposites. So, you know, you, for example, um, R2-D2 is novelly familiar, right? We've never seen one of these before. R2-D2 was made up out of a bunch of different brains coming together. Part of it was like a lampshade, a little bit like a vacuum cleaner. Um, there's a lot about R2-D2 that is totally familiar, you know? Um, a lot like Lassie, actually, the, the, the dog that goes off and does what you need, right? Um, looks very much like a mid-century vacuum cleaner or a, or a postal box, right? Um, so, and I get into why that's exciting. I get into why each of these dualities helps, helps make these characters particularly compelling. Another one is limited limitlessness, which is a bit of a, hand, a mouthful, but thinking of materiality, um, I often hear puppetry artists say things like, a puppet can be anything. Puppetry can do anything. Any puppet can do anything. But that's actually not true. If you're a puppetry artist, you know that you wanted that puppet to do that thing and it didn't do it, right? <laughs> it's like, ah! And, but it's that relationship you have, which we are all now arguing is not godlike. It's not a hierarchy of me over you. I'm the god and you're the puppet. It's a negotiation. The Claudia talks about this a lot too. Um, it, is, it is a synergetic uh, connection. And um, so by the puppet or the material character refusing to do what you're trying to force it to do, um, you, and John Bell talks about this too, you have to actually negotiate with it and then that itself has a creative outcome. For example, Anthony Daniels got inside C-3PO in 1976 and it, it, couldn't, it couldn't walk well, just couldn't, right? So he ends up shuffling. Well now C-3PO has this very distinct shuffle, right? That is, is, is part of his character. It's his iconic characterization. Same thing with these akimbo arms. Right, so it, it it's it's um, that materiality has delicious limits. Yes, it's limitless in a way, but those limitations are also the limitlessness is limited, and that's a good thing. So that's part of the duality. So there's other dualities you can mm -hmm. read about if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Okay, so um, we hit all the absolute must-have points, and now we get to have fun. Great. So was there? Um, since we are going to get in the artist panels into the nuts and bolts of what is this puppet made of and how did you design this mechanism and um, what was the construction process like and how does the material affect the way that you manipulate the puppet? Did you cover any of that and can you give us examples? Yes. I mean, I think that the limited limitlessness is the one where I talk about it the most. Um, you know, there's so many opportunities 
in the way a character is resists you or works with you. Um, maybe I'll slide into the CGI question sure. here. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, one of the things I like to think about with material characters, the term that is useful in thinking about how do we talk about all these non-human or semi-human special effect characters in film, television, and theater, um, I want to think expansively. And so I would consider, I do consider any, even images that are characters that are non-human or semi-human, if they're in live action, even if they're animated images, I still consider that a material character. Mm -hmm. um, I talk about this a bit in my chapter in the, the Companion about CGI and its, its evolution. Um, there's, a, there's a technology called performance capture. Or motion, it's, it's motion capture, but it's like a step further. Andy Serkis, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he, he performed Gollum in, in Lord of the Rings, and he also performed King Kong and a lot of uh, the primates in the uh, Age of Ape, what is it called, the Planet of the Apes? Yeah, so he's a, and he does, he performs Snoke, which is the evil humanoid in, in, uh, in the, the sequel films. <laughs> and he's an expert at performance capture. He really understands how to uh, combine the human with the non-human image. Um, so I give a lot of kudos to that technology. I think it's very exciting. And um, so people have asked me, I, you know, uh, Paulette and I were both at Dragon Con back in September in Atlanta, and there were a lot of Star Wars fans at these panels that we were giving, or that I was giving in Star Wars, and you know, I would do the puppetry ones. And uh, people would ask me to talk about uh, CGI versus practicals. I think there was even a panel called CGI versus practicals mm -hmm. in Star Wars. And I was like, it's not a binary. <laughs> and, right, um, so because, because of these dualities, you actually if you understand them, if you understand the power of material characters, you can actually make the characters serve the story and meaning in a, in a better way. For example, you may not, if you may, I, I feel badly because not everybody's seen everything here, but there's these characters called the Kaminoans in the prequels that have like these, they're made of, they're CGI animations, they're not performance captured, there's pure cartoons in a way, pure animations. They have faces like rabbits and they're, they're kind of white and glowy and skinny and, 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 and very fluid. And I feel like these characters were actually the first CGI characters in Star Wars that were successful because they understood their limitations somehow. And I don't know whether this was intuitive or purposeful on behalf on the part of the creators, but they, in, they didn't try to walk. They just, they would glide, right? And they were very polite and they were very well spoken and they were very elegant. And it suited the sort of fluidity and liquidity of the CGI style, um, you know, whereas Jar Jar Binks did not. You know, Jar Jar Binks was, was, was very, was a physical theater character. And for physical theater, you need stuff, you need physicality. You know what I mean? You're gonna, if you're juggling, you need actual objects and actual gravity. And so that's why that, that character kind of failed. Um, so reason. there's, <laughs> what's that? One reason. One of the ways. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, um, yeah. So um, I think that um, you asked me about materiality, and here I'm talking about non-material intangible images. But I think that that's part of what, what answers that question of, of, of does material matter? And, and the answer is yes. I mean, there's yak hair in, in Chewbacca. And that's meaningful because there's a real organic animal in there and it's woven in a very particular way so that he can move in a way that's very believable. But there's also something novelly familiar about that. You know, we've never seen a Chewbacca before. That was invented. But there's something truthful in, in, in the animal fur that we can kind of feel and intuit. So I hope that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was very helpful. Yeah, yeah. since you yeah. brought up Jar Jar Binks, uh -huh then we can get to your last chapter sure. where you unpack the ways in which these material characters can be harmful. Um, and this was the part of your work that I found most useful because you had your, um, your list of human and non-human. Could you run that down again, please? Sure. Um, uh, right. So I talk about a material character is a character that is non-human, semi-human, or a concealed human, which mm -hmm. is like a offers the opportunity for masks. And I think then you expanded on that. I added about subhuman <laughs> because I needed to talk about Aunt Jemima and the whole minstrel gang. Um, and I also found your work on looking at these CGI characters through the lens of puppetry 
because um, so many of these images that I was dealing with existed as live performance, as performing objects, and as um, brand logos in the realm of illustration and animation. And, and in all of those medium, they performed as what we are now calling material characters. So subhuman to add to the list. But yeah. let's, let's hear what you, Jar Jar Binks, I have never forgiven them for that. I stopped going to those films after that. But um, you were able to analyze what happened with that character. So yeah. please. Yes. Thank you. And many have. Mm -hmm. And you gave me some real courage and help in, in writing that chapter. Um, there's a section in the chapter called The, the Lost Potential of Jar Jar. And I, I chose that title because, you know, Ahmed Best, who performed Jar Jar, his career was nearly ruined by that. And it wasn't his fault. But he also wasn't, you know, just a young, um, naive actor. He was young and he was, but he was al already successful. And um, he had a really thoughtful approach to that character. Um, and I was curious because I'd, I'd been reading about that. I thought, well, then what went wrong? You know, of course, um, Lucasfilm is, was busy saying, well, you know, we didn't mean it. We didn't mean for it to be racist. Of course, we have no racist intentions. But as we all know, that in, it's not about intentions. It's about outcome and harm that, that comes out of it. And you have to take responsibility for that. Um, and so, but I didn't feel like it, it, there, were, there was a lot of talk about, well, why should that responsibility fall necessarily on Ahmad Be uh, Ahmed Best? Um, and so I read about his approach, interviews with him, um, and there's actually a really amazing podcast now that he's, he's given, um, an interview that came out after the book was published um, that is fascinating to listen to about his process. Um, but I wanted to ask, so I was like, well, what part, of, what, part what can I contribute to this in this conversation? And, and I d decided it was, is it because in part because he was CGI? Was, was the fact that Jar Jar Binks was CGI, was that part of the problem? And it, the answer is yes. I think I think it did actually contribute to the problem, um, and and it's um, and there's there's many reasons why there's many reasons within the reasons, but one of them is that he was in some ways a little bit of a goofy character. I don't mean that in a, in a small G. I mean capital G goofy, um, the character, which was actually based on a racial stereotype to begin with. So there was that lineage there, right? Um, that was one of the reasons. Um, and, and there we talk about the negative side of the duality of novel familiarity, right? Yes, we've never seen Jar Jar Binks before. That was a really, when you look at the design process for that character, it's quite imaginative. The designers and builders behind him really studied animal anatomy, really looked at like skeletal structure, really thought carefully about that character and it had a lot of potential. Um, but there's that, then there, but, but once it was put into the context of the characterizations that ended up that character ended up performing um, on in the final film, there was that other familiarity of the racial stereotype, which we're all familiar with if we've watched cartoons, you know, especially if we've watched cartoons, if we've watched Disney films, those stereotypes are in our, in our consciousness. And so, um, so that's part of the problem too. Um, yeah. Uh, and it was just, it was unseen and unacknowledged, but also a huge part of it is context. I think um, um, context is often not considered, and you have to understand that, that you know, what, it's not just about the character in, in isolation, it's what they were, with, they were operating within, which was a franchise in which all of the main characters who were heroes and the villains as well were white men for the most part, it was their world, right? If, and, and the characters of color were very much off to the side. You know, we finally had a, a, our first black Jedi, a Mace Windu, you know, but that was one character. And then there was like a servant in Naboo and that was it. And the rest were, were white and, and frankly British speaking. <laughs> they were given British accents, right? And the sort of native buffoonish characters were sort of coded as, as people of color. Um, and, uh, and that was, so that context was a big part of the problem too, yeah. Okay. Have, have you covered everything that you wanted to yes. say about your book? I'd love to have Q&A if yes, we have Yes, yes. Yeah. So we, we do have time for Q&A. So what I'm going to do is get up and go into the audience and bring the microphone to whoever has a question. Yes, sir. Well, I'm an amateur among experts, but uh, I do have a question. Your presentation mainly seemed to be about the visual experience of puppetry, but I'm wondering about how people with visual limitations experience puppetry or even blind people. Uh, 
there, there has to be some, did they t are they allowed to touch puppets or, I don't know how that's dealt with. That's really interesting. No one's ever asked that question, thank you. Um, I mean, yeah, this is a room full of puppetry experts and maybe someone else could, also, could address that. Uh, puppetry, the puppetry community is very engaged with um, accessibility and disability. Um, there's a large section of, uh, there's a large group of, of puppetry artists who are engaged in therapy, particularly with, and, and um, work particularly what with people on the uh, autism spectrum and children who find that distance from the human being to be particu particularly helpful in social anxiety. Right, <clears throat> but as far as blindness specifically, I would think that um, it's interesting. This is fictional, of course, but there's a period when Han Solo is blind in um, in Return of the Jedi, and he recognizes Chewbacca by the feel. And if Chewbacca had been a CGI character, wow. that wouldn't have been possible. So there's that, and there's a lot of embracing and hugging and petting that goes on between Chewbacca and others, and there's that tangibility. So it's fictional, of course, but, um, but yeah, I imagine if you're, if you're a Chewbacca fan and you can't see, um, and you're at Dragon Con and you meet one of the Chewbaccas, that's, that's pretty powerful, as opposed to shaking hands with somebody who's dressed as Luke Skywalker. You know what I mean? There's that, you know, or touching the dome of um, feeling the, the smoothness of C-3PO. You know, I'm sorry, the R2-D2, thank you. Or the mm -hmm. spherical feeling of, of BB-8. Yeah, there is that tangible element. I would think so, yeah. Thanks for that Great. question, it was really interesting. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Oh, yeah. This is one of our experts here, so. <laughs> Yay. Hi, Colette. Hi. Thank you. Um, <laughs> can't see you. Uh, this, is, this is a question from my youth, rather than really a puppetry question per se, which is, I didn't see the original Star Wars in the theater, but I definitely saw the prequels. Mm -hmm. And I remember the enormous controversy about CGI Yoda. Mm -hmm. And I think you, you sort of addressed what I take to be your argument for why CGI Yoda was so horrific. Yeah. Um, but I, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more of that since sure. it's probably the controversy that I can point to where everyone I knew cared a lot all of a sudden about puppets in particular. Oh, that's great. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> Thank you. I don't remember that as much. That's so interesting. You know, the, someone said to me, I, I teach a class. I'm, I'm about to go to start next week teaching a, a, a seminar on, on this book. And I've taught several seminars already on, um, on the Henson puppets, Ses Sesame Street Muppets, and Star Wars. So this would be like my sixth or seventh time. But every time, generationally, I get a different group of students who have a very different understanding and memory. Like some of them are big Ewok fans. Right? And if you, at, uh, what is the thing? They say, tell us, this is how, how I can know how old you are. Tell me what you think of the Ewoks. Right? That because if you love them, that means you're young. And if you hate them, that means you're like my age. <laughs> so thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I mean, I actually was on a panel at Dragon Con about like Yoda specifically. And they're just, that's a world. Um, <laughs> it's wonderful. It's wonderful. And, and we talked about that. There are Star Wars fans who love CGI Yoda because he can do all those kick-ass, crazy things with a lightsaber. Um, and, and I think Frank Oz also, you know, has spoken to this before. In one of the interviews that he gave, he talked about how it's a tool. So use the tool at hand for the, for the job that you got to do. If he's going to have to wield a lightsaber and fly in the air, make it CGI because a puppet can't do that. Um, so then there's that question of limited limitlessness in which you ask yourself, well, I would have liked to have seen them try. That might have been really cool. Um, you know, and I think, uh, so I think that's, that's, that's a big part of it. You know, I also talk about Grogu, Baby Yoda, and I compare, right, I talk about that a good bit in the book and the success, you think the first Yoda was successful. Yeah. This Yoda was amazing and it was one of the most expensive special effects ever made. And again, one of the most important successful. But because we, he was novel and new, but he also was familiar, reminded us of the original Yoda, that made him more, more endearing to us. Um, but that character, I don't know if you, any of you heard of this, but, um, but they were thinking about making him CGI, you know? And who was it that said, um, well, Werner Herzog was like, you're cowards. And if Werner, Her <laughs> Werner Herzog tells you not to do something, you're going to be like, okay. Because um, he's in the episode, and he's like, this puppet is so magical, it is amazing. And he was like, it brings me tears to my eyes. You know, and, and um, that is a legendary story of, of the new, this is from The Mandalorian, the new streaming series that came out 
uh, a few years ago, the first of the streaming series, which turned out to be tremendously successful in part because of Baby Yoda. But just to, to come back to that, yeah, I mean, I think that Baby Yoda sealed the deal. Make it a puppet. <laughs> Do it, you know? <laughs> you will not regret it. Disney says this now, right? So it's proven. So I, uh, one quick thing, because I think also what a raised for those of us that were old enough to see when they re-released yeah. oh, yeah. four, five, and six was the change in Jabba the Hutt. And I think that was what raised our hackles when the, because when the, they were very close to each other when they were released and when the prequels came out. So I want to say I think that was when we all, we started to think it's like, wait, where are the puppets? And then when it came out and it was like, where are the, and we got really angry. We were a little irritated, and then we got real angry from the CGI. But I just wanted to add that because that was when I remember it, saying, "Saying the job, what is, what's up with Job the Hut? Why is he moving? He's supposed to be moved around." Anyway, to your point. Um, so one thing that I find really fascinating. So a lot of the work, uh, and and my background is with indigenous uh, communities and whatnot, especially you know within the Star Wars. And there's this very much about this sort of claiming, reclaiming of these particular Star Wars characters, um, and especially these these uh, the 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 material performances. These objects are the ones that we in as sort of indigenous nerds uh, have gravitated towards. And so I think my question, because, you know, I mean, there's, there's, you know, baby Grogu, there was tons of stuff when, when, you know, the baby came out and we were just like, no, he's ours now. Y'all go away. We, we, <laughs> this is ours, right? But it doesn't apply to characters. It applies to these, these objects. There's a whole thing with R2-D2 being like, no, R2-D2 is one of ours now, right? Like, um, there's really fascinating art and work that's been done around that. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, and, and you kind of brought this up a little bit in, in the addition, is the cultural uh, connections around this and sort of, I guess, your research around some of the cultural, ex like, the cultural understandings that go in this beyond, say, American culture, right? So like indigenous cultures and global cultures. Um, do, they, do they hold, or do you think they hold in the same kind of way? I feel like I want to have a longer conversation with you, for okay. sure. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so I'm going to say two things that may not fully answer exactly what you just asked, but is related. Um, you know, there there is there was a there you know uh, to say Native American or Indigenous is a, I know that I'm generalizing by saying that, but there was of course there was a love and hate, embrace and rejection going on throughout the Star Wars uh, releases. And you know, one for one thing, you know, I believe the original Star Wars was the first to be filmed to be translated in Navajo, so there was that. And, but then there was also the Tusken Raiders, who were clearly you know playing on the Native American Western trope of the savage natives, right? The the Tusken Raiders, who have now been or, or they were called sand people, yeah. right? Which also, of course, is many familiarities of many racial stereotypes. There's also Middle Eastern stereotypes there as well. Um, so there's been a reclaiming, and I actually do write about this quite a bit as well. I write about Native Americans claiming Star Wars in, in the new, the, the Book of Boba Fett, which is one of the new streaming series, in which they, they, they totally center material characters. I love this. They center material characters. So what I love about the new streaming series, they're not side characters anymore. I mean, The Mandalorian is literally about a masked character and his relationship with a puppet. That's the whole thing. <laughs> so Book of Boba Fett, is about a masked character who becomes unmasked, and he's he's of Maori. He's a Maori, so he's an indigenous man um, in in his in his own identity, and he uses some of the the traditions of of his culture in in the storytelling. Um, and they also use sign language, and they had uh, uh, a sign language a coach to as one of the performers working on that, and um, and they they give the Tuscans a new identity, and and they give them dignity and centrality. Um, I'm not saying it's all perfect. They also killed them all at the end. So, you know, <laughs> Star Wars is a way of like, it's just about to do better and then it doesn't sometimes. <laughs> but, um, but I do write about that and I do look at uh, Native American voices in, in reviews and criticism too. So thank you for bringing that up. But as far as other, I also talk about Asia, uh, the absent presence of Asian cultures too. So we can, let's talk more. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay. okay, I'm not sure. You may be the last question, but anyway. Oh, it's good. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. So. I am not a super fan of Star Wars, but I've seen most of the stuff. I'm just young enough to have not managed to see any of the originals in theaters, but I saw the rest, and I've seen all the streaming servers. Okay. Um, my personal feeling, which is definitely also based somewhat in the conversations that have just come up about, you know, how fans feel about things, is that Yoda, absolutely, right, the puppetry and the material object of the original three was huge, Darth Vader's mask, all those things. That the... N the next three, which are the prequels, 
blah. Um, and then the final three, which are the sequels, okay, yeah, um, that the best character in those three really was Darth Vader's mask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you said, like, it's used as a ritual object. Sorry, this is sort of, but not, I'm not the only one who says this. Okay. Um, so that, but that really was, and that that's almost why they brought it back, because, like, you had to, you, had, you needed something. They didn't have anything else like that in those, and you needed it. Um, and then Mandalorian, which arguably has been the most successful of the streaming series and kind of gave them a restart in a way the movies didn't, you have Baby Yoda, the material object. So my sort of thought is, first of all, that hopefully they're, that they have kind of, but not quite managed to learn a lesson about how much they need that. Mm -hmm. But second, this actually goes a little bit further, do you see this having an effect because they have been so incredibly successful with particularly like the masks, the puppetry in Star Wars? There's so many other properties out there that use CGI famously and all the new special effects that are out there and all this stuff. Is there a sense of materiality, do you think, that is, I don't know, that Star Wars has helped popularize mm -hmm. or what is the problem that somehow even Star Wars then they back away from it and then when it isn't successful they go back to it and then they back away from it, and then they go back to it because they that's what makes that seems very clearly to be what makes these things successful so do you have anything to say kind of yeah absolutely problem? yes yeah so is, is to summarize is, are you asking um, is that okay I, uh, well do you think Star Wars is maybe helping popularize the material in other things yes and why is it people keep backing away from it when obviously they fail when they back away. Um, because that's, well, I think it's, I think that CGI is leaned into because of its affordances, right? And I tell this to my puppetry students all the time. I say, your puppets are gonna have powers and limitations, affordances or powers. There's, there's affordances, things they can do well. CGI is very mercurial. It does language well, the mouth moves well. If you want a character that speaks very articulately, CGI can be very helpful for that. If you need them to transform or fly or be, liquidy fish, they're great at that. Um, they're really not good at gravity. Right. Do you know? They're really not good at tangibility. They can't hug you. So um, you need to know what you're dealing with in, in its affordances and its limitations. Um, so I think that they're learning that. I think when they first leaned into CGI, it was all about the affordances. And, it, you know, and when you have someone who's as all-powerful as George Lucas, he had no <laughs> limitations. Everybody was a yes person. <laughs> Nobody said no, so he was just, you know, going wild with it. Um, and, you, and I, I don't think it's a binary. I think that even I, even Grogu is enabled by CGI, in part. So they, they go back to those affordances. Is it making it more popular? Is it proving the point? Absolutely. There are so many puppet shows right now. There are so many plays, films, Netflix series. With, I can't even keep up with them all. It used to be like a big deal when a new show came out with puppets in it. It was like, make the cover of Puppetry International magazine. And now it's like, oh, yesterday and <laughs> an hour ago. So they're, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Yeah. Thank you. Kate, you to I told you you'd ask me a smart question. Oh, shoot. <laughs> this one is smart. Um, yeah, I, when I, I the, you know, nah, how to start. When I talk about distance and duality, I, I'm often thinking about the puppeteer, the performing puppeteer. And uh, I'm happy that in this conversation that person has not been totally erased and forgotten uh, because in a lot of times, when you know the the New York Times writes about puppet shows, they don't even mention that there's puppeteers in it. <laughs> but it seems like a really, really central figure to all puppet shows that because of their invisibility or uh, secret falling away, that people just forget about them. And I think that they have a really interesting core relationship to distance, the, the literal distance between the puppet and the puppeteer affords you storytelling that you wouldn't otherwise have and like who is this person in relationship to this object um and and i have this other thing i talk about simultaneity and i sometimes i'm like oh god is that different than duality but now that you've said that you have different types of duality i'm like oh simultaneity is like simultaneity is like a kind of duality so my question is about the simultaneity of the puppet and the puppeteer in the puppets in Star Wars. Like, do you think that there is a kind of like juiciness or magic that happens because the simultaneity is going on? And do you feel like 
because it's on film, it's harder to notice? Or is it something that you're like, no, of course, everybody knows that it's, that there's a person in there and therefore the magic is, mm -hmm. is there. I don't know, can you say anything I'm so, about I'm that? I'm so glad you brought that up. And, and, and I just learned this morning that Kate is teaching puppetry at Harvard. So yes, it's made it, people. Yay, she's made it for us on our behalf. Um, so yeah, I talk about it. I think I have heard that term simultaneity. I don't know from something that you wrote or somewhere else, but I have heard that term. I, I call it the duality of absent presence. So there's that paradox of the puppeteer, the person operating the puppet, whether they're using remote control animatronics, whether they're um, in, a, in a motion capture suit, or they're literally going like this. Um, there's a pr they are both present and absent. So they're there, and their work is going to make it onto the stage or onto the film, is going to make it, and it is necessary. But they are also absented in a way. We're asked on stage, just as we saw with Waka Waka show last night, we are asked not to look at them by virtue of their being dressed head to toe in dark colors that recess into our visuals, recess into the background. So we're asked not to pay attention to them even though we see they're there and that's interesting. You know? But on, in the film, as you suggest, um, it, is, it, it is different because they are literally taken away. Like we, they're just taken out in post-production. We don't see any trace of their body. So there's actually a puppeteer running around behind the droid BB-8. Right? There's actually two, I think. And, um, and there's an article that one of them wrote, I want to say Tompkins? I'm trying to remember his name. But he, he, wrote, he was interviewed in Puppetry International Puppetry Journal about his experience as a puppeteer. So even though we don't see them, their work is absolutely there. The choices that they make, the little head turns and all that are there. One of the most, two of the most interesting examples of absent presence to me in Star Wars, though, are Chewbacca, because we see the eyes of Peter Mayhew through Chewbacca. And Peter Mayhew, if you ever see him in behind the scenes interviews or anything like that, he's, he's passed away recently, but he has a very awkward way of walking. He has a very fluid kind of angular way of moving that is absolutely Chewbacca. His legs are very close together, center of gravity is very low. And um, uh, the, the, the actor who is now performing uh, Chewbacca, who understudied with Mayhew for years before he died, um, you now see his eyes. Right? But he's also trying to kind of keep a bit of Peter Mayhew's spirit in the performance. So there's a presence that will never go away there. So uh, obviously Anthony Daniels, I mean, there is no C-3PO without Anthony Daniels. It is a he even said, between the two of us, we make a beautiful sculpture. He understands it's a synergetic relationship. Um, and of course, Frank Oz and Kathy Mullen and, perform and others in performing um, uh, Yoda. I mean, it, it's, it's, you feel, you not only feel the presence of of Frank Oz's voice and comic timing in working with Yoda, but there's also a funny kind of way that he ha he works with Muppets. Muppets are funny in part on the Muppet Show and in Sesame Street because of the way they interact with human beings. There's a bit, and that was permeating culture, popular culture and television when Star Wars came out. We a lot of us like we saw people interacting with puppets a lot, right? And that relationship Mark Hamill leaned into with Frank Oz and Yoda. And so the presence of Frank Oz as a Muppeteer was, was also part of what made that puppet successful. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you for that. Oh, we are right at the hour. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I'll be going downstairs after this to the cafe. So if y'all want to, if you want to pick up a book, um, I'll be down there for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. You can sign if you'd like. Okay. Thank you so much, Colette, and thank you all for coming.